it's on. Institute of Glasgow, among so many things, will also tell us about shoes, cabbages, and ceiling walls. and James Carroll. To preface today, <clears throat> I should explain in Encounter Ourselves. My background is in archives and history. <clears throat> I've written quite a lot of economic history <clears throat> and also quite a lot of history of institutions. And I suppose I've moved away from being an archivist to being interested in information more broadly conceived. Susan Stewart is by background a European philosopher, something that's unusual in the United Kingdom. We don't teach much European philosophy, we teach mostly <coughs> formal logic, and she has an interest in artificial intelligence, um, haptics, and, <coughs> and also increasingly in information. James Currell is by background a biomedical statistician, but he would argue that statistics is as much about information as it is about the maths that go along with it. Unless you've got the information and the data right, then your conclusions will be misleading. And we have worked together, and that's I think how, we come, how I come to be here this morning, <clears throat> in a number of different contexts, and we've explored a number of issues that we, are, we think are important when we look at the migration of information broadly conceived from an analog world to a digital world. And when I was <coughs> asked very quickly to produce a title, I thought immediately of this poem. <coughs> the poem is called The Walrus and the Carpenter, and it was written by Lewis Carroll. But that is not his name. He's probably best known to you as the author of Alice in Wonderland. But his real name was Charles Dodgson, and he was professor of mathematics in the University of Oxford. <coughs> and part of the nonsense that he writes is, in a sense, to destabilize the reader from their comfortable world of reference. I quite like this, um, <coughs> the French, because I like the invitation to speak of many things, because that is what I intend to do. I'm not going, like yesterday, to read a paper in impenetrable academic English, but <laughs> to reflect a bit on the poem. I wasn't intending to do this to start with, but when I read the poem, I thought, well, there's a lot in this that we could discuss this morning. And the first verse begins, the sun was shining on the sea, shining with all his might. He did his very best to make the billows smooth and bright. And this was odd because it was the middle of the night. The moon was shining sulkily because she thought the sun had got no business to be there after the day was done. It's very rude of him, she said, to come and spoil the fun. Well... We know this is nonsense, but for any per piece of nonsense to work, it has got to have reference in the authentic. If it doesn't, it makes no nonsense, because it's got to have some under-referent of sense. We know the sun does not shine in the middle of the night, but the, but the sun does make the billows smooth and bright. And the moon, as we all know, does sometimes shine sulkily, particularly when it's sh shining through a misty cloud. <coughs> and I want to explore this notion of reference and uh, the difference between inauthentic and authentic, because for a something to be authentic, we have, or, uh, we have to, or to be inauthentic, we have to know <coughs> something about what makes it authentic. And we think that, Susan and James and I, much more complex than most people imagine <coughs> the of notions and concepts of authenticity 
in information, <coughs> particularly in the manuscript world, um, comes from a discipline, probably little known to you, perhaps our colleague here, um, as diplomatic, spelt with a Q, a U, and an E, and not an I and a C, <coughs> which has its origins mostly in France, although some people would argue that it's Italy, I prefer France, in uh, the 17th century, when there was much discussion about the authenticity of the titles of monastic houses, pioneered particularly by a um, Dominican friar called Mabillon. Well, the next verse goes, the sea was wet as wet could be, the sands were dry as dry. You could not see a cloud because no cloud was in the sky. No birds were flying overhead, there were no birds to fly. <coughs> When we come to think about authenticity, it is inevitably a retrospective activity. It's something that the beholder does to the information object. There are things the creator can do to make it seem authentic or be authentic, but the, only <coughs> the activity of authenticating is retrospective. It is not proactive. And much of the discussion about authenticity, particularly in the digital age, suggests that it's a proactive rather than a retrospective activity. And this leads, in our view, to considerable confusion and muddle. <coughs> authenticity depends partly, authenticating or the process of authenticating, must depend in part on absences, missing tokens. There is no date, no signature, no address. But there may have been no cloud, no bird. The thing you're looking at may never have had these things. And we can see that very clearly in the analog world if we look at some sorts of documentary evidence. They don't have these things, but that doesn't necessarily make them inauthentic or not genuine. We have other ways that we can test if something which is a scrap of paper with a note written on it is in some way authentic. We, can, we know we have ways of testing that objects that have things written on them, textual representations, or even simply drawings. If you think about Native in, in American Indian communities <coughs> where the blanket with, with, engra with drawings on it were part of their culture, we have ways of authenticating those objects that don't require the sorts of tokens that we normally expect. A scrap of paper, we can look at the paper, we can look at the ley lines, we can look and see if it has a watermark, and we can look at, and we can look at the textuality of the text to provide some token of authenticity. This is a, it's a complex activity, and it does dep depend on presences and absences. The next verse begins, the walrus and the carpenter were walking close at hand. They wept like anything to see such quantities of sand. If this were only cleared away, they said it would be grand. If seven maids with seven mops swept it for half a year, do you suppose, the walrus said, that they could get it clear? I doubt it, said the carpenter, and shed a bitter tear. Such quantities of sand. <coughs> I can tell from your laughter that you can recognize immediately the problems of quantities of sand in the digital age. The vast amount of granularity and standalone objects. I have written, as I said, quite a lot of um, economic and business history, which depends very largely on the use of financial records. And why I refer to financial records in thinking about granularity, um, <coughs> I, I will explain. In uh, digital financial systems, all that exists are grains of sand. There, are no, there is no hierarchy, hierarchy of record keeping. If I wish um, to create a balance sheet, I press a button and the 
quantities of sand are aggregated into a balance sheet. You code up each of the bits of sand, and from that you can generate balance sheets, you can generate the ledger, I can generate journals, I can look and see how many cans of beer were sold in the different shops I own. <coughs> but all that exists in the systems are quantities of sand. This is very different from analog systems that were developed from the 15th century, beginning in Venice and Genoa, <coughs> and systematized by um, a Franciscan friar um, in Italy called... <coughs> Uh, uh, he, 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 who developed the system. His name was Pacioli, and he wrote a book called Divine Proportions. What he was interested in was proportionality, and out of that emerged um, two things that still are with us. Uh, Double-entry bookkeeping, which created from grains of sands, journals and ledgers, balance sheets, profit and loss accounts, so that you could, you could measure, if you were managing a business, how it was performing by simply referring to the aggregations within the various books of account. The other thing he invented, um, which is a surprise, is notions of proportionality in the media. You know when you go and work on the film sets, they do that sort of thing? That sort of thing is an immediate reference to Pacioli's book, on, on divine proportions, the so words and expressions that he developed. Those constructs have disappeared in a digital age and we're left with quantities of sand. And that presents a major problem for those who either wish to preserve it or wish to use it as external parties to those who created it. Can we capture um, the metadata that goes with these bits of sand, and if we can, do we have the tools that will allow us to aggregate and disaggregate them as those who created them did. So it's a major problem if we think about preserving this stuff for the future. <coughs> we have done, Susan and James and I, or thought a lot about these bits of sand we have thought particularly about their identity. There are those who will argue that a digital object, a grain of sand, which is represented entirely by ones and zeros in binary code, has neither identity nor reference. We disagree with that position. We believe that the bitstream has identity and reference, even though logically, its identity changes every time it's open and closed. And we explored that in an article in JSYS um, about five or six years ago. But there are those who don't agree with that position and think the only reference is the thing that the manifestation that comes out at the other end. You can see the real dangers of that position when you consider for a minute what happened in the financial crisis that we've just experienced. One of the reasons that financial crisis came about was that the way the data that underpinned the whole financial system operated worked entirely on the basis of inputs and outputs and no real understanding of what happened in between. If, you had thought, if there had been some thought about what was happening in between, I do not, um, do not believe for one minute that it would be possible for one large insurance company to have bet the whole of the world GDP. If somebody had been wise enough to think about what was happening in the middle of these processes, there might have been some understanding that you could easily create systemic risk but if all you're doing is looking at the inputs and outputs, you see that very clearly in the way that risk was priced using the Black-Scholes formula. You just put things in and you've got an output. And if you, don't, if you abandon the notion that what is happening in the middle lacks either identity and reference, you can easily arrive at that position. <coughs>
The next verse begins, O oysters come and walk with us, the walrus did beseech. A pleasant walk, a pleasant talk along the briny beach. We cannot do with more than four to give a hand to each. The eldest oyster looked at him, but never a word he said. The eldest oyster winked his eye and shook his heavy head, meaning to say he did not choose to leave the oyster bed. Well, what do carpenters and walruses do with oysters? What do they do with oysters? <laughs> yes. And so what we, what, when, when one thing that emerges from that um, perspective, eating them, is recognizing the inauthentic, the tokens of authenticity. A pleasant walk, a pleasant talk, we all know about that. And the eye of experience in addressing information. Information comes from the walrus and the carpenter, come and have a, or come and have a walk, and the wise oyster winks, and the foolish little oysters go for a walk. <coughs> And I think one of the issues that we encounter in, in what we teach, um, we teach a master's course in information management and preservation, um, is the whole notion of the experiential in dealing with information objects. And I use the word information objects deliberately. I won't, don't wish to draw a distinction between things that we conventionally think of as textual objects. Another thing that we stress that once thing, but things become ones and zeros, curatorial boundaries begin to collapse, but we, <coughs> we do talk about the experiential encounter with digital objects. Because in much of the discussion of the digital world, uh, we, uh, we, we come across repeatedly notions of novelty, notions of revolution, and notions that are best described as utopian. If you haven't read it, you should go and read Patrick Fleishy's book, Internet Imaginaire, which addresses some of these utopian concepts <coughs> in the digital. That, this is, that, that somehow we, we can encounter in the digital um, what St. Augustine described as a city of God, which is postponed till after our life. But in the digital, we can experience that city of God uh, in uh, in, our, in our life today, in a virtual way, that somehow disconnects the digital from the analog. And we have always been keen to stress the relationship of the digital to the analog. It would be foolish to do otherwise because information has existed um, as, um, a, a, as, a, as a problem and an issue since um, uh, antiquity. And the other danger that we see in this is that in, in this stream of thinking, uh, the postmodernist view of the world tends to dominate, particularly in the information sciences, not in ITC, ICT, they never heard of philosophy, but in information science, it is dominated by thinkers like Foucault and Derrida with very little discussion of philosophical, uh, philosophical traditions that went before it. And when we teach our students, Susan gives them a whistle-stop tour of Western European philosophy from earliest times to the present day so they can contextualize that philosophical encounter with information and, <coughs> with, um, and, we, and we also stress the relationship of the analog to the digital and we try to explore that and I'll come on to that. The other thing that um, troubles us um, and I am busy uh, we are busy writing about is the kind of aesthetic encounter with information objects. It's very difficult, I think, for those of us who are used to analog objects, if we have come from an archival, a library, or a museum background, we're used to the kinesthetic experience of handling the physical objects. We know what a medieval manuscript looks and feels like, we know what a will feels like. We know what museum objects are like. We, we, are, we are aware and we understand something of their ontological characteristics. When they become surrogates, which is the way that um, much of the, the information that we now encounter um, is delivered 
in, in digital format, it's hard for us to imagine what it must be like never to have seen the originals. James Currell went, um, when he was um, in Washington, to see a famous painting by a British artist called Gainsborough called The Boy in Blue. And it's, when you see it, it's actually rather small, but you have no sense of those dimensions in the digital rendition. It's, about, it's a bit like going around um, the Musée d'Orsay and seeing um, the Impressionists and trying to just say, I've seen all these before, but you've only seen them before on biscuit tins or on calendars. That encounter is very different from the kinesthetic experience of being in the Musée d'Orsay and seeing these things and the excitement and the interaction. And the museum world is becoming very interested in this notion of the bodily encounter uh, within the museum context. And <coughs> we are keen to explore those relationships of the digital or the, or the surrogate asset to the original. And that doesn't just mean in a digital world because surrogate assets um, in throughout the information world have existed for a long time. There have been reproductions of medieval manuscripts, huge reproductions of, uh, or runs of reproductions of the key documents um, in, for example, <coughs> medieval France and in <coughs> medieval um, England. <coughs> Lot, lots of attempts to reproduce. We can see that beginning um, at the time of the invention of movable type. And you see that great flourishing just a bit further north from here of the production of engravings and their widespread distribution throughout counter-revolutionary, the counter-reformation Europe. Um, so it's that, those sorts of encounters that interest us, takes us of course into Walter Benjamin's um, interest in the mechanical reproduction of objects. <coughs> and of course that <coughs> kinesthetic encounter is context dependent and one of the problems, if we refer to the grains of sand, is their often lack of context. The, in, the I individual instantiation of objects in a digital world that lack either connection or context. Uh, a problem that, <coughs> that is very clearly demonstrated in phishing scams. We see that all the time and the more sophisticated they can become, the more context is embedded in them to mislead the user. And those notions of context are notions that are firmly embedded in the analog, in the analog world, particularly of archives and manuscripts um, and museum objects. Issues about where did they come from, who created them, <coughs> can, we, can, we, can, we ver can we provide auth authentic tokens for that context, what was the milieu in which they were produced, think of this city and the great productions of the Burgundian court. How do, we, how do we join all that together in a context that makes sense? And that is something that's often missing from those who simply address information from a digital perspective. The next verse reads, but four young oysters hurried up, all eager for the treat. Their coats were brushed, their faces washed, their shoes were clean and neat. And this was odd because, you know, they hadn't any feet. Four other oysters followed them, and yet another four, and thick and fast they came at last, and more and more and more, all hopping through the frothy waves and scrambling to the shore. Their shoes were clean and neat. Why do users modify their analog behavior in the digital? And I pose that as a question because it's something that puzzles us um, and we try to address. But when we, when we look outside at the world of information and the way um, <coughs> that people seem to interact with the digital, uh, what would seem to be the case is more and more and more. Uh, in that migration to the digital, we have a sort of suspension of belief that somehow information in the digital world doesn't require the same degree of scrutiny 
as information in the analog. And we, 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 you can see that clearly by, um, <coughs> the, by the way in which those who are interested in information or content in the digital have <coughs> reinvented very pompously notions of triangulation, which means in a sort of grand way for um, describing cross-reference. Uh, <coughs> in the analog world, you've got to watch people in a library to know this happens, you look at more than one source to verify the information that you're looking at. Whereas in the digital, <coughs> students particularly say, God bless Wikipedia and copy it all out. <coughs> and we have, we have a strange sort of modification of behavior in the digital world that I think is hard, to, well, it can partly be explained by some of the things that I've referred to already. The notion of <coughs> labeling the technology that drives this as new, as if somehow or other there's never been any technology before, when we all know perfectly well that printing is a technology, and if we think hard enough about it, language is a technology. <coughs> we can also see other forms of technology which are not quite so obvious, such as the ordering of information that came about very firmly during the Enlightenment when God stopped being the middle of the library universe and alphabetical ordering was introduced. And we somehow forget those previous information revolutions in addressing the information revolution, if it is one that we address today. And that's something that in our teaching we put a good deal of emphasis on. And we explore notions of similarities and differences. And we do this when we're teaching by having two whiteboards and getting the students to write up on the boards what are the same and what things are different. And there is a sort of gradual dawning that actually there's a lot of similarities. And when we actually are worried about the content rather than the mechanisms for delivery, Marshall McLuhan wasn't right, and that the content is more important than the medium of delivery. And we tease all that out so we can come back to notions of diplomatic and notions of diplomatic in a digital age, which takes us to how do, how do I know this is what it purports to be? And for some of the reasons I've explained already, there are problems in the digital which aren't uh, so acute in the analog. But that doesn't mean they cannot be resolved. And we increasingly have tools that allow us to do it. But the way we, the context in which we use those tools often separates the analysis, the digital forensics, for example, from the content itself. That there is a mismatch between the technicians who can do all this stuff and those who are actually interested in the information object itself. Whereas in the analog, that is largely not the case. You need a partnership between both specialties. You need a partnership between the technologist and the information curator or owner. And that is something that we stress in the notions of digital curation. That one of the problems in digital curation is that technicians tend to wag the tail of the dog. Whereas <coughs> in the past, the curator has been in charge of the strong box <coughs> and have held the keys, in other words, control the technology. Now that is an unsustainable position from our perspective in the digital world that the curator can't control the technology. And there has to be a fiduciary or trusted partnership between the curator and the digital or the technical because quite easy in the analog world, you just have three or four keys to a building and only if the three or four key holders are present can you get in. That was common, common practice pretty much throughout the world. If you look in Buddhist societies, you look in Western European societies, you encounter much the same sorts of arrangements to ensure that the strong box is a fiduciary or trusted box. That cannot be the case 
in the digital, a few curate, well, almost no curators could have enough knowledge of the technology to actually deliver that standard of trust. And if they did, they wouldn't be able, probably don't have the skills to do what they're supposed to do, curate the content. The walrus and the carpenter walked on a mile or so, and then they rested on a rock, conveniently low. And all the little oysters stood and waited in a row. Foolish things. The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot, and whether pigs have wings. Here they are, and there is the carpenter and the walrus sitting down. This is, I think, an important metaphor, and one that has troubled um, sociologists and even neuroscientists um, and anthropologists in the, in the Anglophone world. And that is the whole issue of um, reflection and re re reflexivity. Um, <coughs> if you, if you, if you in, in, encounter... Um, have, you, have, those, have, you any, have you any read David Levy's book, Scrolling Forward? If you haven't read David, Le David Levy's book, Scrolling Forward, I can commend it to you. David Levy uh, helped invent the thing that is sitting in front of me um, at the Passa Alta Laboratory. He is also um, a calligrapher of some distinction, and as his name might suggest, he is Jewish. And his book, Scrolling Forward, uh, addresses um, the impact of this stuff on the way in which we handle and interact with information. And he spends quite a lot of time thinking about reflection and re reflexivity in the way in which we address information objects. Uh, and the other, there are others that, um, that, that, that have share um, his concern that the interaction with this thing stops or inhibits reflection and reflexivity. Um, it, it, it creates an experience that means you don't look at the wall and you don't, you somehow stop thinking. Now you can argue, you can agree or disagree with that position, but it's one that is well worth um, uh, um, <laughs> uh, thinking about um, and exploring, and the way in which David Levy is quite critical of the way in which um, libraries have simply become populated with banks of PCs. Um, there is an absence of what he would regard as a sort of agora, a place for interaction, discussion, um, and simple reflection. And uh, towards the end of the book, um, he dwells on that quite a lot, and his Jewish um, past clearly interplays with some of those thoughts. But Susan Greenfield, who was a very um, influential um, <coughs> neuroscientist in Britain, has similar sorts of concerns. They're not concerns that are simply in the information sciences from where David Levy comes. He now teaches in, univers uh, in um, univers State University of Washington um, in the north, the north end of um, Carolina. <coughs> um, and uh, so he, this is an issue that goes well beyond simply the information scientists. And now, and then the other issue that comes out of that, that, that first is issues of auth authenticity and identity. And they must be confirmed by more than one token. One token um, simply won't be enough. And <coughs> if you couple authenticity to identity, particularly with information objects, and objects that confirm other sorts of identity, you are in pretty deep water. And this is an issue that I have explored, um, that some of our students have explored, the notion of the relationship between information objects, uh, identity, uh, cultural identity, national identity, family identity, places in society, um, <coughs> where it, it is argued that in the modern world there's an increasing, mean, uh, uh, increasing alienation, a lack of notions of identity, and the connectivity, certainly in Western European culture, between uh, information objects, especially those that relate to family history um, and notions of uh, self, or so it's alleged, and notions of memory, and how using 
um, records, uh, particularly records about individuals, you can create a notion of identity. And one of my students is, take, is going to be examined on her PhD on Tuesday looking at this whole complex issue of family history. It's a huge appeal um, in Europe um, and North America and its relationships to identity and then taking that a stage further, the new, I the new form of family history or genealogy that can be discovered in um, getting your genetic makeup um, analyzed and how these things relate to one another. And they have a long, as we all know, and complex history in European culture. They go back to the medieval period, um, and that's what she's done. She's tried to contrast this long thread of, rela of the relationship of identity to of the, I the identity of the self um, and uh, to the identity of documents and their authenticity and notions of memory uh, in a very interesting and appealing way and a way in which um, many uh, professional historians, so-called, are deeply suspicious. They don't like family history. Historians, they clog up archival search rooms and they seem to be doing something that is largely, in their view, a waste of time. <coughs> when we look at the, the tokens that authenticate the objects themselves, we, um, we, 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 ha we can explore those, and sealing wax is a good, is a good thing um, because it is very, it's, a very obvious, um, it's a very obvious token in the analog world. come across quite a lot of it. Um, you come across it uh, on uh, documents from the medieval period right up pretty much to the present day. And then very interestingly, if, I, if you visit Japan, Japan, for all its technolo 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 technological advancement, if you've ever been to a Japanese lavatory, you'll know what I mean, <coughs> is still a sealing culture. They use seals all the time. If we were in Japan, we would all have a seal in our pocket. And we could bring it out, it looks like a pencil, and we could use it. And we, we could seal documents with it, we could seal envelopes with it, if you go to check in your luggage um, in the hotel, you get a receipt that is sealed by the hotel staff. And the seals they're using are not the seals of the hotel, but their personal seals with their names engraved on the seal um, or a character, caricature of their names. And everywhere you go, you come across seals. If you go to a temple, there is a big seal, which is the seal of the temple, and you can collect those in a special little book to show that you've been to different seals. And if you ever have the chance to see the imperial seal, it is an enormous thing that um, is still stamped on documents to provide authenticity and authentication. And there is no suggestion amongst the Japanese that it should be any other way, that this notion of sealing is deeply embedded in their culture. And that I think raises important issues about uh, cultural differences but in the use and uh, ac access of information um, in a digital and global age. If uh, ICT is really en enabling a global economy, then surely these cultural differences in the use and access of information must be um, addressed. And Charles S., who is just, has just moved from Jury University in the States to the University of Aarhus in Denmark, has done a lot of work in addressing these cultural differences. He uses, as an example, a surprising company. It would never occur to you that they are aware of these things, and that's McDonald's. You may think the yellow banana is a universal symbol. And so it is. But the way that yellow banana is delivered across the globe is heavily culturally dependent. And McDonald's do that by employing psychologists who understand the cultures of the world in which they're operating. And it goes beyond not having pork on the menu in Muslim and Jewish cultures, but to understanding the way in which information is accessed in different cultural contexts. If you go to China and look at a Chinese newspaper, it is dense. The first page is completely dense. 
And that is because that is the way in Oriental cultures you receive your information. You receive it densely, whereas in a European context, we would expect it to be much more hierarchical. You don't put all the news stories on the front page. If you go to Middle Eastern countries, the, the culture of information is very dependent on social hierarchies. It descends through social hierarchies. And notions of democracy, like those that we are trying foolishly to impose, in my view anyway, on, um, <coughs> on um, um, Afghanistan and Iraq and Iran, are just misplaced because that is not the way in which information traditionally is, is, is delivered um, to communities. See much the same sorts of problems um, in India. The other thing that we, we have looked at um, quite a lot is the notion of, bi we have called it binding, partly because uh, in traditional diplomatic, it's pretty much all or nothing. If you don't do all these things, then your document is not authentic. And if you do all of them, then people will think it to be authentic. We don't buy that at all. Kings require a high level of binding when they're, for example, giving land grants. And you get a great big piece of parchment with a whacking great seal on it, which is normally the great seal of the kingdom, the king's official seal. And there are different sorts of seals for different sorts of activities that the monarch might undertake. If I am writing to my lover, the sort of binding I need is very much less. And the sorts of tokens that I might use in constructing my letter will be very different. And for those of you who don't know, there were rules for doing this in Western European culture from the 17th century. You can buy books about how to do it. The sorts of letters that you should write to your lover, the sorts of letters that you should write to your lord, and so on. <coughs> and there were all sorts of conventions that if you left a lot of space between your signature and your, your correspondence, that space was called significant space, and it represented respect. And these are all social conventions that develop in the analog world. One of the things that we do with students is ask them how many of them were taught to write a letter. And even today, nearly everybody in the class will put their hand up. If you then ask them, and how many of you were asked to write an email, nobody puts their hand up. And so those social conventions are deeply ingrained uh, in our society. These notions of binding, how you lay out and produce a letter so that the recipient knows it's a letter, knows it's from you, knows the sorts of things that letter might be about because of the way it is constructed and the salutations and valedictions that are provided. Look at the salutations you get in emails. My accountant wrote, recently wrote to me and it said, Michael, hi, and I thought that's a good one. <coughs> we simply don't have, we haven't translated those disciplines into our digital world. And lastly, pigs do not fly and the sea is not boiling hot, except, as we saw yesterday with the jumping wolf, virtually they can exist. We can create, as it were, in this digital environment, what um, Susan Stewart has described as a virtual city of God, where we can be in heaven but still be here. But wait a bit, the oysters cried, before we have our chat. For some of us are out of breath, and all of us are fat. No hurry, said the carpenter. They thanked him much for that. A loaf of bread, the walrus said, is what we chiefly need. Pepper and vinegar, besides, are very good indeed. Now, if you're ready, oysters, dear, we can begin to feed. Pepper and vinegar can mean only one thing for an oyster. And, of course, that took a long time to drop. <laughs> And the context, that context, as we've discussed already, is present in the analog and is missing in the digital. And I thought that Michael's um, uh, archive online, where he's capturing that context from other stuff, uh, is very interesting and does provide, in some ways, it some way relates to things that we've been doing. And it demonstrates that it can be provided even if it wasn't there in the first place. And I think context, if you think about oysters, only if it comes with a glass or two of dry white wine, which is what I particularly like with oysters. 
And what I'm getting at here, and we have explored, and James Curl and I uh, ran a big project called Effective Record Management, which was largely about this issue of context in the digital world, is issues of value added. People will not add metadata to documents unless there is some added value in doing so. That is, if it comes with a glass or two of dry white wine, or it comes with something that makes what they do um, in their daily life, um, if somehow improves it or adds value to it. They simply won't do it if, if they can see no added value to themselves. Now, this might all seem terribly brutal in sort of management speak, but it's true. And we spent a lot of time in the effective records management project that we did in striving towards ways in which we could, uh, we could make, and this was mostly um, administrators within the university, uh, we could provide them with tools that added value to their work. And by that, I mean if they were writing minutes, it would be easy enough for them to capture from another source, in other words, a database, of all the members of staff of the university, the people who were present. So they didn't have to type it out every time. Uh, they could use common forms. They could use it, that, that would be provided, which would have metadata built into it. So all they had to do was to fill in the date and uh, the date and place of the meeting, and that would simply appear on the, um, on the common form that they were using. And I, I think a lot of people from the information perspective rather than the ICT perspective simply assume that you, add, you, 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 you will add metadata because it's what you do anyway, and it isn't. It is, oh, you will only do it if you can see some point in it. And the information professions particularly got themselves, or have got themselves, into a terrible mess because they thought, and I would count myself amongst them foolishly, that the search engines wouldn't scale, and if they wouldn't scale, the only way that information objects could be relatively easily was discovered was if elaborate metadata was added, um, particularly if you used the Library of Congress subject headings. Any of you who have ever used the Library of Congress subject headings know that it's not something you want to do lightly. <sighs> and of course what the search engines do is they don't address all this metadata. I was involved in an enormous project in the United Kingdom where we had to add vast amounts of metadata to digital objects. In this belief, it didn't happen. We twigged that wasn't going to happen and we put a lot more effort into the keywords and the way we constructed the texts that describe the objects, which we could also think of as metadata, rather than these elaborate metadata schemas uh, centered around the Dublin core, which are very expensive to implement and this is a big area for discussion and research, and I think there is a real tension here between what traditional librarians capti cap uh, captivate or uh, embedded in their own paradigms, um, that applies to librarians and archivists and to museum curators, um, and what they seem to be arguing for are handicraft industries, which are hugely expensive, when the ICT community is saying something very different. And <coughs> these issues, again, are not easily resolved. I'm going to hurry up. <coughs> but not on us, the oysters cried, turning a little blue. After such kindness, that would be a dismal thing to do. The night is fine, the walrus said. Do you admire the view? It was so kind of you to come, and you are very nice. The carpenter said nothing but cut us another slice. I wish you were not quite so deaf. I've had to ask you twice. A dismal thing to do. Uh, that takes us to issues of trust, a very overworked word. Uh, we hear it a lot, particularly when uh, in, in issues of audit and the audit of information. Like authenticity, it is retrospective. Don't, you do not just trust someone just because they say they're trustworthy. And think of um, phishing scams. Trust is about relationships, which when you think about the way in which the digital world operates and the epistemic communities that are created in the digital world, and we can see that very clearly in, with, in, in what happens with the pedophile networks on, on, in, in the digital world, that the, this degree of trust, this suspension of disbelief, the suspension of, the suspension of analog practice um, becomes a real issue 
um, and a problem. Uh, in the corporate world, in the world of government, in the world of, the, not the, say just the private sector, but the public sector, the word trust is beginning to be replaced by notions of governance, um, particularly in the wake of the financial crisis. And that has spilled across, certainly in the United Kingdom, from the corporate sector into the public sector, that the notion of trust is more about governance and government than it is about these, this sort of very simplistic notion of trust. And if we actually think about the analog world and the way in which information objects were created and generated, they are largely a reflection of systems of governance. If you think about kings and bishops and monasteries, um, the sorts of documents that we use a lot, they are really the outcome of governance and trust is implied from that system of governance. We wouldn't trust records produced by, um, the, by the Nazi regime in Germany because we don't trust the, the governance. It's not that we don't... We the, the, the lack of trust comes from the regime and the structure that informs it. See exactly the same sort of thing in the work of Vern Harris. Anybody heard of Vern Harris? Great archivist in South Africa. Um, Archives and Justice is his most recent book where he explores those sorts of issues which really are about governance. And I think that is the right way for the information profession to move in the wake of what, what happened in the financial because you could, a lot of this stuff was trustworthy. These complex um, financial derivatives appeared quite trustworthy. They just lacked any sort of governance or governance structure. And I think this also raises other issues. I mean, do the oysters have only themselves to blame? Does some moral responsibility lie with the walrus and the carpenter? That might sound rather trite, but in the 1970s, when there was the last serious financial crisis, um, Juris became very interested in this moral question, and we can see it re-emerging at the moment, this notion that the, the, the purveyor, the, 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 the actors in information objects, do have some moral responsibilities, and that's what I was hinting at in the last paper, um, or the, in the paper that we heard at the end yesterday, that there are moral and ethical questions that need to be addressed, and they often require, however much we may dislike lawyers, um, some, um, some jurisprudence, something that certainly in the United Kingdom isn't taught very much these days. But there are juridical issues that lie behind a lot of this, and I, I think we, we, uh, we are at our peril um, forget that there is a juridical imperative in a lot of information, and that the rule of law is an important concept that we forget at our peril. And we can see that very clearly in the United Kingdom at the moment um, over an issue I also referred to yesterday, and that is the very large bribe which was paid to the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, some one billion uh, pounds, a little over one billion euros, for um, some contracts for armaments. And <coughs> the... The, 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 ju the judges in Britain have ruled that they wish, the, they, wi they want to have a judicial review. They have said quite clearly that the rule of law always overrides the executive, and executive action cannot be above the rule of law. And of course, information is the thing that underpins from medieval times um, that concept of the rule of law, which emerges in Europe rather hesitantly. Um, earlier slightly in the United Kingdom or elsewhere um, in, from the Enlightenment onwards. It seems a shame, the war was said, to play them such a trick after we've bought the lands out so far and made them trot so quick. The carpenter said nothing but the butters spread too thick. I weep for you, the war was said. I deeply sympathize. With sobs and tears he sorted out those of the largest size holding his pocket handkerchief before his streaming eyes. And that brings us to the moral dilemma and the level of binding within the contract. Notions of contract, I think, are interesting because that's what a lot of this is about, notions of contract, which are context-dependent, context particularly if you are in danger of being eaten. Oh, oysters, said the carpenter, you've had a pleasant run. Shall we be trotting home again? 
but answer came there none. And this was scarcely odd because they'd eaten every one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, is there any questions or remarks that anyone would like to do? Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I really liked your image of uh, sand uh, because it's such a, in a way, physical experience when you're on the beach and you're sort of touching sand, like that it falls through your hands as a way yes. to understand its quality. So with this idea of, of, the, of data or information as a stream, I was thinking also with your concern about the lack of re uh, ref uh, reflection and reflectivity. Uh, reflex <laughs> <laughs> um, do you come across any, let's say, digital tools that allow this kind of reflection to happen? Because I think to say that the computer stops us from reflecting is a st like we can't really do that because we're surrounded by them. So do you see tools or methods or practices where this kind of touching the sand is happening? Do you understand what I mean? Like well, I, well I, think, I think there are two issues here. Well, one's, the, one's the grain of sand and the, the, the way in which digital objects are single instantiations. And if you just think about it, in the way we keep digital objects, they tend to exist as instant single instantiation, even if they are, sorry, even if they're in things that we think of as files, um, they tend to be single instantiations. The file, which emerges um, in the United Kingdom uh, in the late 19th century, which is a, an adaption of um, registry practice throughout Europe of the, the, from the docket. The docket was a single document, those of you who don't know, and it was endorsed with some metadata and it becomes a file. Um, and the file is about a subject. And the way in which digital objects exist, don't, they, don't, they aren't like that. And that's why I use the, the, the example of um, financial information. They just exist as single bits of stuff which have to be aggregated and disaggregated, and they can be aggregated and disaggregated in all sorts of different ways. Um, there is a lack of understanding of that, I think, about, about the user interface. Um, the library community spends a lot of time talking about information education and um, the, the things they ought to be doing in order to enable this encounter with digital objects. As far as I can see, having read quite a bit about it, they haven't got very far. And the debate about it um, tends to be rather polarized. Um, have any of you heard of a book by Tara Brabazon? called University of Google, where well, it appeared um, last year um, in the United Kingdom. Uh, she's an Australian. Um, those of you who know anything about aircraft history will recognize her name. It was the, her father or grandfather was the person who built the largest propeller-driven airplane. I can remember seeing it as a child. Um, <coughs> but she wrote this book called University of Google, which is a huge attack on Google. And it really becomes a sort of rant that it is stopping thinking that people who use Google are really muddle-headed, it's inhibiting what goes on in the classroom, it's inhibiting interaction. But it, it, that's, what it, that's what it becomes. It becomes a rant about Google and digital practices, particularly um, in education. And it's not, in any sense, counterbalanced. Um, there are better books. I mean, I, I think Patrick Fleishy's book,